Good morning to our participants in the United States and good afternoon to our attendees in Europe. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany in New York, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion. Please make sure that your mics are off so that there's no background interference and that your video is on so that we can take full advantage of this Zoom meeting format. As we've all observed in recent years, national governments have been increasingly dominated by political polarization, crisis management, and partisan gridlock, often rendering them unable to join forces to address common global challenges. In light of such roadblocks at the federal level, subnational actors such as cities and states have often stepped in to fill the void left by traditional nation states. This trend has been particularly tangible in transatlantic relations and in the German-American partnership. And in recent years, both the Aspen Institute Germany and the ACG have worked to engage decision makers and opinion leaders at the state and local levels. To further explore collaboration at the state level, the Aspen Institute Germany and the American Council on Germany have joined forces to host a virtual event series titled State to State, German-American State Legislator Dialogue, Together, it's our goal to provide a platform for subnational exchange and in-depth discussion between German and American state legislators on common domestic challenges that can also be viewed through an international lens. We at the ACG are incredibly excited to collaborate with the Aspen Institute Germany on this new series. And I'm delighted to now turn things over to my friend and colleague, Stormy Miltner the executive director of the Aspen Institute Germany, who will introduce today's topic and moderate the discussion. Stormy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Steve, uh, for those wonderful opening words. Um, it's really a pleasure um, that we have the opportunity cooperating on this really important um, initiative. Um, we at Aspen um, have a state legislator um, Langtagsabgeordneter Dialog, um, which is supported uh, by the European Recovery Fund. Um, and um, we have been doing so um, over the last year. And we are absolutely convinced that it's so important um, to talk on the state level with each other. Um, may it be on health related issues, pandemic preparedness, um, digital issues as we will today, um, but also environmental issues, education, there is so much um, to learn from each other. And this is what we want to do today. Um, today, we want to zoom in, um, excuse the pun, <laughs> into, the, in, into the question of what digitalization um, is doing to politics, policy making and elections and the other way around. Um, in our little pre-talk of this event today, we talked about that there is a lot of, th that digitalization, like our Zoom call today, um, really offers us to get together. We wouldn't have been able to pull this off without Zoom or Teams um, or any of the other technological advancements. Um, but maybe not everything is so positive um, with regard to digitalization and politics, um, and this is uh, what we want, want to discuss today. And um, we have a wonderful panel um, with uh, Daniel, Daniel Kareis, Katharina Schulze, or I could say Catherine Schulze, uh, because we are so tra transatlanticists, and Mark uh, Berman, or Mark. Um, and um, I would like all of you to introduce yourself, starting with Katharina, um, and tell us why you are here today and why you are also interested in transatlantic relations and a state to state exchange. Katharina. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation and I'm happy to discuss with all of you the important topic of digitalization. We only have one hour, but the topic is so big. So we try to get into it really quickly. My name is Katharina Schulze. Um, I'm a member of the Bavarian State Parliament since 2013. So I'm now in my seventh year. Wow, no, eighth already. We have, to, okay, so pretty long already. And I'm the, um, the head of my parliamentarian group um, in the Bavarian State Parliament. And uh, as you know, if you're a head of a parliamentarian group, you're 
responsible for nearly all topics, uh, but I have a really uh, strong interest in everything which is regarding uh, digitalization, homeland security, um, and our societies. So I think uh, we are living in a really interesting time where uh, transatlantic partnership is more important uh, than ever or in the last years. So I'm really happy that uh, we are having here the opportunity to uh, strengthens the bonds between uh, our two nations where we have the same values and work and we can work together for the a good future for everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Katharina, being here today uh, with us. Um, Daniel, why are you here and why your interest in transatlantic relations? Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Daniel. Um, I'm a member of the parliament in Baden-Württemberg, uh, which is in the south as well, uh, since two years, because uh, I'm uh, I was following up my my uh, my the, the member of parliament who was before he was getting sick, so he decided to to hand over uh, the mandate, and uh, so I'm there since two years and uh, we are voting on Sunday so it's <laughs> I'm in the middle of the campaign uh, but I'm very happy to to have this discussion uh, although it's not uh, part of my campaign uh, because um, it's quite important to me to to have the exchange between uh, our systems our uh, different uh, ways of, of political uh, uh, um, of political uh, uh, statements and our, our uh, uh, well, it's quite hard. I, I just said before, uh, it's uh, very hard to, to use English uh, <laughs> in political discussion. So I'm sorry if I'm getting some, some uh, words wrong. Um, yeah, and yeah, and uh, I'm very interested because um, it's important to uh, follow the, the friendship of our two countries and uh, um, we already have some some uh, work together to do as California is part of the under two coalition, uh, which is a, a, an alliance uh, to to reduce the, the, um, the temperature increase of the world um, due to climate change and Bad Württemberg and California are very strong in this alliance and uh, so we already have some uh, some parts to do together and uh, so I'm happy to learn more and uh, especially about digitalization because that's my uh, my part of uh, of my work in in the parliament so far great thank you so much um, and your English is perfect so please don't worry <laughs> Mark Thanks, Stormy. And, and Daniel, if I were to speak in German, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Uh, so I so, uh, appreciate everybody speaking in English uh, during this panel. My name is Mark Berman. I, I'm an assembly member, a, a California State Assembly member. I represent the 24th Assembly District, uh, which is kind of the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, Palo Alto, uh, Stanford University, um, companies like Facebook and Google. I also represent the California coastline, like you see behind me, 30 miles of California coast uh, from Half Moon Bay down through Pescadero to the Santa Cruz County border here in Northern California. I was elected to the assembly um, four years ago. So I'm starting, I guess, in the early part of my fifth year in the state assembly. And I chair the elections committee uh, in the California state assembly and, and have been very focused on elections issues uh, during my time here. Uh, and I mean, transatlantic relations to me are very personal. Uh, my my grandpa was born in Germany. My grandma was born in Poland. Uh, they both immigrated to the United States right before World War II. Uh, I, I studied in Italy. My wife studied in Spain. My mom studied in Switzerland. Uh, and just recently, my dad's small little company was bought by a much bigger German company uh, that wanted to fold his company into the big German companies sustainability goals like Daniel was talking about uh, around how we can uh, reduce and recycle more plastics uh, in the world. And, and so it just shows, you know, that's international relations, cultural relations, it's economic relations, the ties uh, between California and the United States and Germany uh, and, and our other transatlantic partners are so important. Um, and like Steve mentioned, you know, more important now than ever, as we've seen um, a, a kind of abdication of that international role at the national level 
Um, so I've been really grateful for the conversations that I've, I've got to have with, with my German friends over the past couple of months uh, and look forward to this morning's conversation as well. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for being here. And um, I think some of us are um, getting a little bit jealous uh, seeing where you sit. And uh, <laughs> I'm not there right now. I'm technically in the capital, <laughs> but I can't wait to get back to the district. I am. I am sure. Um, we want to make this whole conversation as interactive as possible. Um, I will talk a little bit with our three panelists, but then I also want to open it up um, for discussion. Um, you can raise your hand um, via the um, chat function um, or via the raise hand function um, over the um, through the participant uh, symbol. And um, so please, oh, and, and you, you could write a comment, but we would prefer if you actually talk to us so that we um, really get talking with each other. Um, so um, let me stick with Mark for a second. Um, one of the topics we, um, we had or we have on the agenda today is this, the, the concept of digital de democracy. And that sounds like a really fluffy, cloudy concept, very abstract. What does it really mean um, in a politician's day-to-day -day work when we talk about digital de democracy? It's, it's a great question and a great point. And I think it means everything. It means organizing and advocacy and, and how our communities can use digital tools to organize and find like-minded people uh, and engage in the political process in an easier way and build numbers and build strength in doing that. Uh, I think it means participation in the political process for the public. And, and we found that a lot in the COVID era. And I know we'll talk about that a little more, I think, this morning. Uh, campaigns and voter outreach like Daniel is going through right now uh, and new ways to reach voters. Uh, one thing that we talk about but haven't figured out in, in California yet is digital voting uh, and the ab ability to, to vote remotely and, and some of the pros and cons uh, and, and risks of that. So those are just a few of the things I think that digital democracy, uh, you know, in a tangible way really means. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, Katarina, um, what do you see as digital democracy? Um, I would add uh, some more points to what Mark uh, is, was saying. Uh, I would say, first of all, we need the digital infrastructure. Because if you don't have the digital infrastructure, digital democracy is nice on the paper, but not in like bits and pretzels and how you we say that so we need a fast internet and a stable connection everywhere. Um, here in Bavaria, uh, my party and I, we are rooting for that every household has the right to have a strong and fast internet connection. For me, it's like having uh, water and ele electric electricity. So you need also the internet uh, at nowadays. And if, you, and if the state cannot provide the infrastructure, then we cannot then talking about voting digitally is like the fifth step after the first. And I would then add as well, for me, digital democracy has a strong data protection because if you're talking about digital democracy, you're always talking also about people, about personal information, and this has to be protected. And the third thing I would say, digital democracy is especially for me, uh, a digital administration. I can make I can make a small example from here back home. I'm living in Munich, the capital of Bavaria. And if I need to um, get a new passport because my old passport is expired, and then I have to have an 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 um, an, an appointment at the administration. And I think, come on, it's 2021. Something like this has, has to be digital. So digital dem democracy means for me that the state uh, that the state and the politics and the administration is a service provider for the people who are living in the state to help him or her get uh, faster access, easier stuff, whatever um, in the in, in the cooperation and the communication between political state field and the. Uh, and the people who are living in this state. And uh, da Daniel, do you agree with uh, with Mark and Katarina on those issues? Uh, quite a lot. Um, for me, to me, um, digital democracy is more about participation of the people uh, in 
in affairs of uh, governmental decisions. Um, that's about transparency due to, uh, um, it's about transparency so that you can um, see what, uh, what is the cause for some decisions the government uh, did and decided to do. Uh, and it's about um, lowering um, the, and now it's about uh, getting easier some, some services like uh, um, uh, uh, renew a passport or something like that. Um, it's about data protection and it's about the responsible usage of social media. That's a quite important topic uh, to me as we have seen in the US uh, uh, a few months ago. And um, so that's quite important and it's more about um, transparency, participation and services we can use because we can open up a bank account completely digital, but we can't uh, uh, use, uh, uh, we can't get a passport in a digital way. So we have to go uh, in person to, a office, to an office and that's not um, the state of the art I would uh, expect of a state like uh, Germany is. Thank you so much. Um, I think now we have a better understanding what digital democracy is. And if I may, I would like to dig a little bit deeper um, on a couple of things which also Katarina mentioned, and that is uh, participation and access. And I wanted to ask all three of you um, if in your constituency, um, during the COVID um, pandemic and when everything has become more digital, do you feel and see a di digital divide and do you really reach everybody? And how do you try to um, achieve this? Um, and so that we don't have always the same order in the speakers, um, I would like to start with Katarina, then Mark, and then uh, Daniel again. Um, yeah, I think Corona and COVID um, shows two things. First of all, that we have to be faster and that a lot of things are working. Even if people are saying, oh, you cannot do digital, discussions transatlantic just online we can do it we just prove it now uh, on, on the other hand uh, COVID shows where we have a big 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 lack All, uh, and if we're talking about digitalization in my state we have still rural areas where there is not a fast internet connection where students cannot participate with uh, video and uh, microphone for the school hours which is embarrassing and it's not working and we're also having the uh, the divide between are you rich and do you have like money to buy for all your children an own device and then i don't know a nice lighting that you're looking good while you're talking or if you're um or if you're um money bag is not so full, so you're uh, kind of uh, not participating uh, in, co in COVID times uh, with the dig digitalization. So I think politics has to change that. So we have the short time things we can do. So for example, getting every uh, every student and an, an, an laptop, um, this, the state has to provide that. And on the long-term run, we have to get the infrastructure fixed uh, so that, uh, if we're having the next big thing coming over us, we are better prepared for uh, digitalization and working and um, studying. Um, Katarina, if I may ask a follow-up question, because you're pointing a lot at the, um, the younger population, which is right, I mean, we have a huge education issue. Um, what about the older ones though? Um, how, how do we, I'm, <laughs> how would you ensure that they also have an opportunity to participate um, in, well, socially during, during COVID times? Yeah. I would uh, say we have to look at it also um, uh, in differential ways. Um, uh, older people who have <laughs> children are learning now really quick. I see it from my own parents. They are now even more digital uh, than before because uh, we explained them everything to them. But of course, there is also a group which may have not does not have the help or just can't use it. So um, I think the state has to provide um, a, a double. Uh, 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 so. so Okay, I try to make it as an example, then it's easier for me. For example, if you're talking about getting the, the shot for a vaccine, 
um, the Bavarian state government, uh, her, her, their first action was, oh, we're putting up an online tool and the people who are over 80 are getting a, a vaccine shot first. So, I mean, I have in my own family, people who are over 80, it's not working. So, so I was kind of like, what are you doing? If you, what is, if you want to um, get the older people first to be vaccinated, what, what I think is really good, then you have to make a good planning and write them an, a letter or call them. I mean, we have a telephone, you know? You can also call the, the old lady or the old man and tell him or her when their appointment is. So I think you always, we're at the moment still in this time where we have these kind of two worlds. They are overlapping because even some older, some older people are pretty good at digitalization and some younger people are very bad at digitalization. I don't like generalizing these two uh, topics, but as long as we have this overlap of the, these two worlds, um, and an, in, an inclusive politics has to provide information on both ways, digital and analog. Thank you so much. And with this, I hand over to Mark. <laughs> I just want to agree with everything Katarina said. Um, and, you know, the, 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 all, all the points, honestly, the points about uh, access, the points about we, even in California, even in the heart of Silicon Valley, even in the shadow of Google and Facebook and Hewlett Packard and all of these big, uh, you know, uh, uh, technology companies, we, I have thousands of constituents that do not have access to reliable internet. I have thousands of constituents, tens of thousands of constituents that do not have the tools needed to get online. Um, and that's in urban areas and that's in rural areas like, like what's behind me. Uh, and, and that's, for me, it's tens of thousands of constituents across California. It's millions of Californians. And like Katarina said, uh, I've been kind of saying the same thing. We need to think of the internet as a utility. It is, it is that critical to our daily life, like Katarina mentioned, just like electricity and water, and more so in, in COVID. And it has made the divide between the wealthy and the poor even bigger uh, over the past year. We've seen that with education. We've seen it with telehealth, um, which I think is a really important application uh, of, of you know, new digital tools and, and, and the internet, especially for rural uh, uh, constituents who maybe you know, instead of having to drive four or five hours to the hospital, if they can just get on the computer, uh, it saves them a lot of uh, pain and suffering uh, from the travel. But one, and then one additional thing that, that Katarina was alluding to is digital literacy. It's important for all of our constituents and especially our older constituents to understand that you can't believe everything that you read on the internet, that you have to check your own sources, that people, there are bad people out there that want to trick you by saying things on the internet that are not true, misinformation, disinformation. Um, and, and that's become one of the risks and one of the downsides, I think, of the digitalization of our society uh, is, is how a lot of people get uh, tricked into believing conspiracy theories and things that, that aren't real in America. Uh, it's the, the biggest one nowadays is QAnon. Uh, and this QAnon conspiracy that had directly led to an attempted coup of the United States government, um, the, the January 6th insurrection in Washington, D.C. So a lot of, a lot of factors um, uh, to, that, that we need to work on um, over, over the next couple of years to make it fair and equal for everybody, and also to make it so that everybody uses uh, you know, internet and digital tools in a, in a healthy and productive way. I hand over to Daniel. I think there is a huge gap between especially the older ones and the younger ones because uh, a lot of older people don't want to use digital uh, stuff because uh, they just didn't learn it. They don't know how to use it. Uh, they just don't want it. And so I think uh, all digital abilities we build up have to be more complementary than a substitute, um, as um, there should always be the, the possibility for a man or woman to go to an office and talk to someone, to, to the accountant, and, and 
tell uh, talk about the problems and about uh, um, uh, what you want and that's quite important because we have to ensure that people don't um, go too far away from each other so so you have to uh, get in contact i think that's quite important to uh, to make um, government uh, the, the government and the administration more um, i would say peer level so you can uh, um, um, experience it more and you can uh, see that there is a, a, a someone behind it and not just a, a computer you are looking into and you are getting something out. Thank you so much. Uh, Katharina mentioned earlier um, that uh, digital, digital democracy has a lot to do also with privacy protection and data protection. And Mark, you mentioned several areas like e-health, for example, um, or telehealth, um, which involves a lot of data uh, sharing. And this brings me to an important topic, which I think um, also has an influence on access and usability, and that is the issue of trust. And trust has been eroding in politics or for politics for quite a while. So I wanted to um, start with Daniel and ask you um, about the issue of digitalization of politics and trust and how you establish trust in your constituencies. Well, I think in, in the past we uh, lost a lot of trust in government, uh, governmental decisions as uh, there was a lot of um, a lot of uh, things which were done, like uh, we have this e-health card uh, where we have our uh, health assurance uh, system on, and there was a big discussion about how safe is it, are my is my data protected, and who can look up what uh, my sicknesses are and, and, and uh, what problems I have. Um, and so there, there we lost a lot of trust, but I think that's a pretty German thing to to be uh, to to mistrust um, the government, and and uh, that's quite a problem. So I think we have to explain more and to give uh, the security to the people that they 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 believe in uh, in uh, the uh, uh, to believe that their data are protected. And uh, that has to be um, done by by uh, strong regulations and um, about uh, by very uh, hard um, fines. If you about hard uh, uh, and by hard fines, uh, if you are uh, violating these regulations, and that's quite important, so that the people can trust and they see, okay, if someone is doing something wrong, he has to be judged and he, he will get a fine. And uh, so hopefully he won't do it. Maybe we're getting a little bit also into a transatlantic, di transatlantic divergence here. Um, <laughs> you mentioned we need strong regulation um, for trust to be established. I hand over immediately to Mark if that would also be your answer or if your answer would be slightly different. No, I, I, I totally agree with, with Daniel. Uh, one of the things that I did in California a few years ago was I, I uh, carried a bill, I introduced a bill to create an office of elections cybersecurity uh, so that California, it was the first time that a state in the United States had its own office of elections cybersecurity instead of just relying on the federal government for that. Um, so that especially in something like literally our democracy, our election system, we wanna make sure that, that the public has that, the most trust uh, that what is happening is is fair and accurate, and that we uh, provide more oversight and regulation over what people are saying about our election system. I also had a law, uh, carried a bill that became law that made it a crime, a misdemeanor, a, a small crime, to intentionally trick people about how about the voting process. Um, so if you put on Facebook, vote on Wednesday, November 9th, when the election is on Tuesday, November 8th, you know that that is a crime. Uh, you know we we need to make sure that um, there's there's more accuracy and trust. Um, but then California followed Europe 
on the privacy component, we kind of followed the, the GDPR, which I don't remember exactly what GDPR stands for, uh, but, but Europe's privacy policies and regulations in creating the California Consumer Privacy Act um, to, to try to, you know, you, you hope that people are going to do the right thing, but sometimes you, you need to verify and, and make sure that they really are and put the power back in the people, put the power back in the consumer to know what information is being collected about them, to be able to determine how that information is used, you know, and, and it's a change in thinking and it's a, you know, it's a change in how we think about our information, which is an extension of ourselves uh, and, and who really controls that. Is it the business that collects it or is it us, uh, the people that the information is about? Um, so that was a little bit all over the place, but a few thoughts on, on this really important topic. No, perfect. Uh, more similarities than differences, Katarina, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I'm happy to hear that because I think... Um, a strong data protection can be also a benefit, uh, not only for corporations, but also for our states. Because if you're looking at globally and how the world is kind of shifting and ch ch changing, I totally believe that if you can provide as a state and an, 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 uh, a society where uh, the data of the people and the data of the companies are protected, then this in the long run, my personal belief would be like a, 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 a benefit and a corp also for corporations, but also for the people who are living there. But because who wants to be like an open glass as a, as a, um, as a, as a person? And definitely Daniel, um, I, I would agree. We in Germany, we have a special history with that. But uh, that's not. But that's coming from something, you know. We had uh, uh, the Stasi. Uh, we we had a situation where the state was watching its own people. So I, I, I think it's good to be kind of uh, prepared and and uh, as a democratic citizen uh, to to uh, to want to know what 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 kind of data your state has and stuff like that. So I think uh, strong rules and of course, uh, a hard control, controlling of uh, these rules are uh, totally uh, important. And then this could, re could lead to that we are, we are benefiting from uh, this stronger data protection. So last sentence, I always don't like it if people are saying, oh, because of data protection, nothing is working because um, the, as far as I can, have a, the look at my state, uh, it's often not the data protection why things are not working. It's not working because the process are too slow, because the infrastructure is not there, because we are having a mentality of, I'm not responsible, that's you, or we don't have any creati crea creativity. Um, data protection is like really on the back if, some, um, if you want to discuss why new inventions are not working or why they are working. Great, thank you so much. Um, I would like now like to open up for discussion. Um, and I already saw that Heinrich Kreft, um, you raised your hand, it just it disappeared again, um, but I still want to give you the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Stormy. I, uh, I would like to, to echo what, uh, what uh, many of you said. Um, I like the, the comparison uh, of the internet uh, with the with utilities. Uh, and uh, Stormy, you mentioned the uh, trust. Uh, and uh, if you if you take the utilities, if you take electricity, it's electricity can be dangerous. Um, take water um, with um, with uh, if the water uh, supply is not safe. Uh, if if the water itself is not safe, you can you can poison the whole city. So you need regulation in order to create trust. Um, but uh, the question is, and uh, I think uh, Katharina Schulz mentioned it uh, already, the question is, yes, you need regulation, but how much and what kind of regulation? And the devil is really in the details there. And this is, this is really complicated. And uh, we need really to put our heads together uh, on both sides of the Atlantic to, to come up with, um, with best practices. Uh, what uh, what 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 works? What doesn't work? Um, 
we should not uh, use um, uh, cures which which kills the patient. Uh, so we, uh, we we need something which uh, which really works. And uh, and I think uh, we are we are we are seeing the same problems uh, around the globe. So we uh, we really have to learn from each other. So it's not really a question, uh, uh, but uh, but a comment. Uh, thank you. Um, Heinrich, um, almost everybody knows you as an old transatlanticist, but maybe you can say nonetheless um, who you represent. Okay, I'm, I'm a German diplomat, but currently I'm in Budapest. I am holding the chair of, uh, of diplomacy at Andrasi University in, uh, in Budapest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and if I may, I, um, I would like to collect a few comments and questions and turn it then back. And we have one by David Shamatz. And um, David, or, or David, you wrote in the chat function, um, but would you like to take the floor um, and talk to us? If not, yeah, oh, please, thank you. <laughs> yeah, my question was about uh, the CCPA, being that California is gonna default US standard, you know, it's the GDPR of the US, and the uh, elimination of cookies and other privacy issues that have kind of come up and regulated. How are we dealing with the fact that the big four digital companies, the Googles of the world, aren't affected by this, but the vast majority of companies are? So how do you deal with that gap and how do you deal with the inequity in the system? Great, thank you so much for this also very specific question. Um, and with this, I would turn it back to uh, Mark and then Daniel and Katharina. And please, everybody just raise your hand um, and use the opportunity to get right into the discussion. So Mark, please. Yeah, and David, thanks for the question. This, this would normally be the time where I would say, that's a great question and let me research it more and get back to you. Um, and, and since I can't do that, I, I guess I'll default to another kind of um, you know, high level response, which is we're constantly learning that the, I mean, just like in technology, you iterate uh, and you throw something out there, you try to do something, you learn the, what works, what doesn't, where there might be gaps in the policy, and then you follow it up with additional policies. So, uh, you know, this is something that uh, is a little bit too in depth for my knowledge uh, off the cuff. Um, but happy to look at it more and, and see, you know, where, where are, uh, areas that we need to strengthen CCPA, um, or, or where is it maybe creating an unfair playing field uh, that might be benefiting, benefiting the bigger companies and, and harming the smaller companies, which is definitely not our intention. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, maybe Katarina and Daniel, maybe, maybe you have some examples of best practices, um, how to deal with uh, data privacy. Well, it's quite hard to, to have a, a best practice, but in Europe, we have the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, which is a law um, uh, which is uh, for the whole European un Union. And um, that's, a that's a law which had the aim to, to handle with Google, with Facebook, uh, to protect the data of, of the normal uh, uh, consumer. Uh, and, but the problem is that we can't really handle, uh, uh, can't really uh, get hands on Facebook and Google because they are international companies. So, so we can't uh, really uh, control them. And that's, that's the, the hardest problem we, we face to because um, we can't uh, uh, change something. We can, can only uh, uh, guess what is happening behind the doors of Facebook and Google. And so uh, that's quite hard. And we have this uh, very strong regu regulation, but a lot of smaller companies which are uh, in digital businesses, they, they uh, have to handle with it. And that's quite hard for them because uh, they have a very uh, uh, strong restrictions. Uh, and uh, the, the original aim, Facebook and Google uh, can do whatever they want, almost. <laughs> so it's quite hard. I, I wouldn't call it a best practice. It's just a, um, a kind of reality we, we have to, to look at and we have to uh, react it. Maybe if I can add something uh, to the future, wouldn't that be a perfect transatlantic project that the US and Germany would work together to get these big multi-dollar 
internet companies um in kind of let let me i don't know i, I hope i put it correctly in kind of the right, right place i mean i am also all using all these tools so um it's not about them that they're not allowed to do business anymore but it's that they respect the values and the rules of the countries where they're operating in and that it's not like uh, if you're a small company you're kind of struggling all the time and if you're a big company you are having the the, the doors wide open for, to for to every person who can decide something so i i'm i'm a strong believer in that we need strong politics and i'm and i mean that's our job Poli the, to be in government or to, to or to do politics means that you have to sometimes make rules and laws which not everybody likes but that's part of the game that's part of the deal so so so, so getting kind of the strength uh, um, uh, together again and then if we could partner because as daniel mentioned the the european union can have really strict laws if the companies are sitting in another country it's getting a little complicated so um um, making there a transatlantic approach and um, how we can work with that and how we can learn from the things which went well and from the things which has have to be better and then make an alliance and uh, work in the same direction i think that would help a lot the people and the companies and there might be an opportunity for this um, the european commission has proposed a transatlantic tech council to discuss these issues. Um, and um, another issue on the agenda um, is the digital tax. And while that was a no-go the previous four years, um, Janet Yellen um, indicated that there might be some room for discussion um, on the digital tax. Um, I have now several questions, uh, several persons who would like to participate in the discussion. It's Edwin Wiley. Owen Beats and Romy Sabelius. And I would like to go in this order and get, uh, give Edwin the floor. Yes, th thank you very much, Stormy. Um, I am an independent consultant and I've been uh, living in Germany now. It looked at the calendar, it's been 20 years now. And th there's a subject that always comes up when we get into the, the area of, uh, of technology and, and that has to do with a broadband penetration. And I've watched Germany now uh, as a, a, an interested and in participating, but still an outsider, fall farther and farther and farther behind. It never seems to make any, everybody talks about, we must have fast internet. And now, oh, we've been taken over by Portugal. And oh my gosh, Moldavia has moved ahead of us. And, and then you, you start doing it, well, what's going on? And that's why it's very good to have people who are more at the grassroots of, of politics. I was speaking with the mayor of Ilmenau, uh, who, who came originally from the Technical University. By the way, he's from, his political party was the Buckverse party. Didn't really find a home in all the other traditional ones, but they set up the party and immediately won. And what he's trying to do is to get uh, a fiber optic cable installed in Ilmenau. Wow. Now there's a local initiative. Of course, what he has to do is he has to fight against Deutsche Telekom. And who is the biggest shareholder of Deutsche Telekom? The Bundesrepublik. And why, why should Deutsche Telekom make any investments if they can just keep the money in their pocket? Why should they go out and spend money on fiber optic cable? Anyway, I just wondered if, if there were any perspective, uh, for example, from, from Silicon Valley about where I understand, yes, there are gaps and uh, there are gaps in internet uh, connectivity there. Boy, if you wanna see gaps come over here. Uh, we're still using fax machines at the at the health ministry. But anyway, just uh, is, uh, what are the reasons for this this incredible uh, lack of progress? And here everybody talks about it. There's 80 million people in charge of it. Nothing seems to get done. Why? That's that's a valid question. Um, but let let us um, hear the other two. Um, so the floor is yours, Owen. Hi, hey, thanks. Yeah, my name is Owen Bates. I'm a student at Brigham Young University in Utah in my final year. And my question is a little more general, just going back to cybersecurity. Um, I'd be interested. So as democracy becomes increasingly reliant on digitalization, um, some people are concerned that 
malign influences, both domestic and foreign, are also becoming increasingly sophisticated in their ability to have cyber attacks and other cyber security crimes. Um, what would your response be to constituents who fear that and who are kind of concerned of, of the increasing reliance on digitalization in democracy? And does that maybe expose us to more threats um, than it otherwise would if we didn't embrace digitalization as much? Thank you so much, Owen, for raising this question. It was one on my list, and I was very much hoping that we would get to this, especially um, in the light of the upcoming elections in Germany. Um, it is, in, and if we are still not over the COVID uh, crisis, then there will have to be some electronic voting, I think, and um, then it becomes your question becomes spot on. So, um, last but not least, Rome, um, would you like to take the floor? And I hope I pronounce your first name correctly. Oh, I have been called many things, so that was close enough. <laughs> well, my name is Romy Zabalius. I was born and raised in Germany, and currently I live in San Jose, and I'm a professor at the California State University. And I'm sorry, with the sequence of the Zoom hand raising that I don't speak directly to digital uh, issues, but more uh, global and, and societal issues, um, a crisis that we have experienced or experiencing right now is a paradigm change and paradigm wechsel in our societies that we rarely experience in our lifetimes. I would maybe argue that 9-11 was the previous one and the fall of the wall in Germany, uh, the unification one for Germany that had such a magnitude and such a shift in society. And when this happens, the people who suffer are victims from policies and rules and organizations and organizational structures that were established before and they come to the forefront we they were always there but we see them more clearly in times of a crisis um katarina talked about the inequities in education when we had to shift immediately from in-person classes to online we were not aware how how terrible the digital divide really is. And in medicine, we have discovered in the United States that um, underrepresented minorities are disproportionately affected by the COVID crisis. There's nothing so much we can do but analyze it and then move forward in a, in a mindful and intentional way to build better system, make better rules, uh, for more inclusive society and social justice. And that's, that has to take place on the organizational level to examine presence of systemic racism and eliminate these. It has to happen in new communities in Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg in California, but internationally too. And that's why this forum is so important and the dialogue between um, nations and, and larger companies, because many things go far beyond the regional level, like the digitalization. Google is not a California Silicon Valley company, it's a world company. And the, the talk, keeping the dialogue open and uh, assessing honestly our mistakes can help us to take actually advantage of the crisis, to, to as, as many hardships as have happened, to, to learn and, and, and build something better. And this is a positive uh, outlook and the, the optimism that I have, and I hope uh, leaders will share that we should not only lament what we have done badly in the past, but that we learn from it. And, and, and you know, look, not only look to fix the pr problem at the present moment, but really, really long-term. So when the next crisis hits us, we are better prepared. We will still, still suffer and many of us will still suffer, but we will be better prepared and better balanced and maybe achieve a greater equity. So I'm, I'm sorry that was a bit long winded, but uh, I'll leave it at that. No, thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's spot on to talk about resilience and what we learned from the crisis and that we really 
um, bounce back for, I mean, bounce forward instead of just trying to bounce back. So thank you so much for that contribution. Um, I always have to have half an eye on the time um, because we only have an hour. Um, and I know that Katarina needs to jump into um, her next meeting. Um, there are um, two more comments, which I would like to read before I hand it over to a last round with our speakers. Um, and then I also want to give, give Steve um, another opportunity to say, say something um, to, to round us off. So the two comments, um, the first one is by Susanna Hartig. Um, she says, I would like to get back to digital literacy of citizens on both sides of the Atlantic. States should make more efforts to engage all segments of society here. And Detlef Schwarting says, I believe um, it was a very valid statement that the status of digitalization in Germany is a disgrace um, and without excuse, this must be addressed. Ooh, and um, so I hand over to our last round. And so, I mean, I, I, would, I would love to have more time, but this is not going to be the last time we are meeting. Um, so um, I start with Katharina first, just in case you need to jump off um, and then Daniel and then Mark. Thank you so much and sorry I have to leave really on, on, on point uh, on time but I'm happy to be a part of this very interesting conversation. I try to go through the good questions and remarks real quick. Let's start with digital literacy. Totally agree to Susanne Hartig. Um, my party and <laughs> we're in the Bavarian State Parliament rooting for um, trans uh, for a new education uh, because I think we're still being our old at least in Germany, in our old way of people need to kind of uh, know everything. But if we're honest, if people go, go out of the school, they have to be uh, critical, they have to know where their resources are from, and they have to kind of work with the things that they're seeing, and they have to be uh, socially uh, stable and uh, work in teams together. So I guess we have to, we have to, um, change the education in schools and universities and of course the education of the teachers because the teachers should uh, learn that to the children so we you really have to, uh, to work on the education of the teachers and then have some changes there uh, digitalization in germany totally agree it's uh, it's a pain it's it's crazy I don't know why it's not working. I just can tell you that we're ruling for it so hard. And I think it's just a responsibility problem. And um, I think somebody just, the state should just take money and effort and kind of the like, uh, put it on maybe not number one, but on the top list of what should be achieved. And then um, I think it would hopefully be better. And cybersecurity, thank you for the interesting question. As a uh, Homeland Security person, I, I think it's really, really important. I want to uh, mark three things. First, I think the international, uh, the working together internationally on these issues has to be better because crime is not stopping at the border. So why should be the fighting against crime stopping at the border, first one. Second one, of course, more protection, helping as also smaller companies getting fit in all this protection stuff. And the third thing is, and I always say it in the Bavarian State Parliament, I want that the best hackers are working for the government. And if we want that, we have to pay them more. Because if you're a good hacker and kind of open to work with the government, um, then, uh, but you have these interesting money things where you can go to Apple or Google or whatever, I mean, they will not come. So in Germany, we have a very strong system of who gets how much money when he's so long in the governmental field, whatever. So I think we have to be more creative and make, make it uh, attractive that the best people in this field work for the government and protect our society. And the last point is, um, I'm definitely sure, that, sure there will be more big challenges for us, climate crisis. I'm here, the green one. So um, this is already happening, you know? The, 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 the idea of that after COVID, everything will, be, will go back to normal is just wrong. And we all as a society would be silly if we're not learning from this crisis and if we would not update um, all the things which were not working so well. And if we're not also in a big effort, um, get the resilience of all of us uh, stronger. 
So, and for that, probably my colleagues can make even more examples. So I will just say thank you very much for the discussion. And it was really nice chatting with you. Well, I agree to Katharina uh, in most of her ways she, uh, and, and her statement. Um, I would like to focus on Edwin's question, which was about uh, the bad shape of digital infrastructure and broadband infrastructure in, in Germany. Uh, I think uh, we did a big mistake in the past because uh, in the 80s, there was uh, the Chancellor Helmut Schmidt and he wanted to build up a, a completely uh, a, a complete um, optical fiber network in Germany. But then there was a change in government and um, the following chancellor, Helmut Kohl, uh, decided to promote um, the, the, the television cable networks. And television cable networks are able to, to transport some internet signals, but it's uh, not quite as good as uh, fiber optic cables. So um, we have a, we had a long, for a long time a quite good infrastructure, but uh, we just uh, um, wasted and, and we, we didn't develop it uh, to the future. So we just uh, waited and were happy about our uh, quite good infrastructure. And now uh, the world turned a bit more and uh, now it's, uh, we are quite in a bad shape because we didn't uh, realize that there is a whole uh, disruption going on and the digital transformation uh, which is going on and we can't uh, hold it up and um, there was some political parties uh, which uh, tried to to say well we don't need digitalization and our current chancellor angela merkel said um, uh, just a few years ago i think it was uh, 2017 or something like that where she said it's a kind of uh, new land we are going on uh, in terms of the internet and if you are saying that uh, in the year 2015 or something like that uh, you you can see um, that it's not uh, a main topic in the governmental policies um, which are done in germany and i i don't think that it's about money it's more about the regulation because we have a quite difficult situation in the market of telecommunication. I, before I, I, I get in, got into the parliament, I was working for a telecommunication company and um, it's a quite difficult and it's because of the near monopoly of Deutsche Telekom, uh, which is owned by the Federal Republic of Germany partly. And that's quite a problem because um, so there is no real interest in uh, economical terms to, to uh, evolve uh, the, the regulation. And, and so we are just um, in, a, in a very uh, bad situation and, and we should solve it politically, but um, at, at the moment there is no real, um, no real effort to do it. Following up on on uh, Daniel's comments and and Katarina's comments, um, quickly to to Owen's points about kind of cybersecurity issues around uh, democracy and, and elections. We're in California. We're actually going the opposite direction uh, because of concerns around uh, you know interference by by either foreign or domestic bad actors. We our ballot uh, our our voting systems our voting booths in California cannot be connected to the internet in any way, shape or form. We have mandatory paper backup ballots so that there's something physical that we can audit after the election to make sure uh, that that the result is accurately reflected and, and you know, uh, that there's, uh, there wasn't some, some gap in the system where people were able to interfere and, and change the results. And that's, on, that's, that's pragmatic. That's good, and it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that that we we have to move in that direction. You know, more analog and less digital. I had a bill last year, um, and another bill this year to make permanent my bill from last year that required that we mail a ballot 
to every active registered voter in California. And I think Utah might already do that as well. I think they were they were ahead of us uh, in, in mailing people a ballot. And so it's being realistic about the fact that unfortunately there are bad actors out there that wanna interfere in our democracy in all sorts of different ways. I had another bill about deep fake technology uh, around elections and, and the attempts of people to use manipulated media, uh, deep fakes, and also just other more uh, low tech manipulated audio and video to, to trick people about what politicians and candidates say, um, because technology now has created a, a, an ability for people to, to, to put their words in my mouth and confuse voters uh, about what I believe or about what I've done. So it's definitely a huge concern and, and has caused us to slow down a little bit on the digitalization of uh, elections uh, out of fear and concern about the, you know, those, those bad actors that are trying to interfere. Um, I, I can't speak much to the issue of broadband in Germany, um, but we have similar problems in California and in the United States, uh, where you have certain, uh, you know, the, the, the big stakeholders, the, the big companies in certain regions uh, around the, the state and the country that have a quasi monopoly on, um, you know, providing access. And that's why we, we all need to kind of mentally shift how we think about it from more of a private good to a public utility. And I think as we do that more and talk about that more, um, you know, we'll, we'll change the policies appropriately. Uh, and then Romy, uh, you know, brought up the, the, the great difficult point of government is not good at getting ahead of problems. We're very react, uh, reactionary and, and reactive to, to what's happening. But I think this has taught us that, uh, I think it's highlighted some of the inequities that we all knew existed uh, already in our communities, um, but we didn't see it as starkly as we do now. Um, and I think that's a positive uh, moving forward uh, of addressing those inequities in a more systemic um, and, and serious way. Um, and then we need to, we need to, you know, anticipate that this won't be a every 100 year thing um, and, and put the policies in place uh, that will benefit society. I mean, having those policies and, and uh, preparing for the worst, just inherently those different act actions will benefit our society and I think will make a more equal society. So I know we've gone over time. Really appreciate uh, the conversation, the opportunity to chat with folks. Uh, I look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you so very much. Um, there are also some more comments um, in the chat function. Um, before we had started our dialogue today, um, Steve said, you don't have to call on me um, in the end, um, but you're being too modest, Steve, and too, um, and just too humble. So I'm going to call on you anyways, because you're one, I mean, the mastermind behind this dialogue. So please, Steve, the floor is yours. Well, Stormy, thank you. That is that is very kind of you. Um, I I would like to say that the 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 role of mastermind is shared on many shoulders, um, your shoulders, my shoulders, but also those of our our colleagues. But I really want to thank Katerina, Daniel, and Mark for setting such a high bar for the state to state series. I thought that this discussion was absolutely outstanding. Um, and it's been fascinating to, to listen. Um, lots of questions have bubbled up in my mind, lots of comments, but I've been holding back. And, you know, Mark, just at the end, you said that, uh, you know, this current moment has, has highlighted inequities, but I would also say it's exacerbated some of those inequities. And one of the things that I would hope to, that we could get into in the future is what are the lessons that we've learned from the last year, from this moment that has affected all of us? And how can we try to make our communities better, but how can we work together across the Atlantic to maybe develop some policy solutions that work both in Germany and in the United States? In each of our state-to-state -state sessions, we'll be focusing on a different topic, and everybody should know that on April 21st, please mark your calendars, we'll be focusing on, on climate policy. But particularly after today's discussion, I think we could spend just an hour on digitalization and its influence on political practices, but also government, um, but also the very important point of digital literacy and much more than that, how to detect fake news, how to deal with deep fakes. Um, but 
in the vein of the inequities issue, really unpack how do we overcome the digital divide? And of course, you know, tied into all of that is building a robust digital infrastructure, which you know, maybe is a standalone topic, but is certainly one that runs through all of this. But I would just like to thank the three of you for being such great speakers. Um, I'd like to thank you, Stormy, for the excellent moderation as ever, um, and to the team at Aspen for collaborating with us um, to, to kick off this series. Thank you so much, Steve. And that only lets me to say Team Aspen and uh, team, um, team, uh, team Stormy, so to say, and Team Steven, um, please wave so that everybody knows um, who to talk to when you are more interested in our dialogue. <laughs> and that um, leaves me with, with uh, saying goodbye. Thank you so much to all our participants being here, asking those excellent questions. We hope to see you in our next state to state, state of the art um, dialogue on climate, uh, climate change and climate policies. And I always end by saying stay healthy and stay um, as Romne is doing, doing, I wish you all the best um, and hope to see you soon. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>